How do you imagine the perfect speaker system? You are likely thinking of big, boxy cabinets with multiple drivers and probably a subwoofer next to them. You are most certainly not imagining anything like this. I've always wanted to try making speakers that do not look like speakers, that do not stick out but instead blend in and complement my living space. Well, I think I have finally done it and the end result is quite literally a work of art. Yes, these original paintings are also speakers and they're made out of roughly $50 worth of parts. So how do they work? How did I make them? And most importantly, what does the sound like? Stick around to find out. First, I want to show you the secret ingredient that makes this project possible. It is called an exciter or a tactile transducer and it looks very different next to a typical speaker driver. On the back side of this woofer is a magnet. If you look closely, you will see a coil of wire inside it and it's wrapped around a paper cylinder. The cylinder with the coil is attached to the paper cone on the front, which is also called the diaphragm. So they all move together. When a signal passes through the coil of wire, it makes it move back and forth. This in turn moves the diaphragm, which creates vibrations in the air. We perceive these vibrations as sound. The exciter also has a magnet and a coil, but it doesn't have a speaker cone. If I give it a signal, we can see it moving, but we cannot hear much. That's because the exciter is designed to be attached to a surface. When it's in contact, it transfers vibrations to that surface, which effectively turns it into a speaker. And it works surprisingly well. If you are as fascinated by science and technology like I am, I think you're gonna love Brilliant, the sponsor of today's video. Brilliant is a learning app with over a thousand lessons designed to make you a better thinker and problem solver. You can find courses on anything from programming, mathematics, data analysis to AI and how everyday technology works. Every lesson is interactive and based on actively solving problems and puzzles. So as you gain new knowledge on a specific topic, you are also exercising your thinking skills. Each lesson takes only a few minutes to complete, so it's easy to find time to learn something new every day. Thanks to Brilliant, I have developed a daily learning habit, and solving a puzzle is an excellent alternative to social media whenever I need to take a break from whatever I'm working on. You can try everything Brilliant has to offer with a free 30-day trial, and if you use my link below, you'll get a 20% discount on a yearly premium subscription. Just follow my link in the video description or scan the QR code to get started. Thank you, Brilliant. Now let's go back to exciters. You might be wondering why they are not very popular if they're so amazing. Well, it's because they have their downsides. One is that the quality of the sound they produce depends greatly on the surface they are attached to. Fortunately, Dayton Audio has a detailed guide on how to pick a suitable surface and then how to attach the exciter to it. I'll have a link to it in the video description. For example, it is a bad idea to put your exciter in the center. It has to be slightly off to the side to avoid standing waves, which will amplify certain frequencies but attenuate others. For my project, I decided to use sheets of acrylic plastic, 3 mm in thickness. The guide says that it works ok as a material and I already had a bunch of big pieces, which I bought at a discount a couple of years ago. I tried cutting the acrylic with a Japanese saw. This kind of worked, but I had a hard time keeping a straight line. So I just split the acrylic into two pieces that were roughly the same size. Then I took out the router and put on a flush trim bit. Notice the ball bearing at the tip. This bit allows you to trim pieces very precisely using a template. In my case, the template is the flat side of my workbench. The two pieces of acrylic are clamped on top of each other, so I can cut them both equally at the same time. After one side was done, I rotated the pieces 90 degrees, aligned them to the table with a speed square, clamped them down again and trimmed the next side. Here is the result. Nice, clean, flat sides all around and perfect 90 degree corners. Now comes the part where two boring pieces of plastic are transformed into works of art. Unfortunately, I am not much of an artist, but I know someone who is. This is Chrissy, a young artist from my hometown. Even though she had never painted on acrylic, she was excited to give it a try. So I gave her the two pieces and let her paint anything she wanted that would look good in my bedroom. 
you can follow her if you want to see more of her work. And while Chrissy was busy making art, I had to build the stands for my speakers. My idea was to put the pieces of acrylic on a frame made of plywood. I wasn't sure what that was going to look like, so I sketched a few models until I came up with a design I liked. The front side, to which the plastic pieces are to be mounted, is flat, while the back is slightly curved to look more fancy. Another piece of plywood holds the two sides together, while also providing weight at the base for stability. Initially, I wanted to cut the plywood on my CNC, but I quickly realized that my machine wasn't big enough for the task. So instead, I designed the shape in Fusion 360, then I split it in two halves and cut them on the CNC for absolute precision. Then I clamped them to a fresh piece of plywood and traced the outline with a pencil. The piece of plywood was big enough to fit two sides, so I traced another one next to it. I used my jigsaw to roughly cut out the two sides of the frame. But notice that I left a bit of material all around on purpose. That is because I wanted to trim it with the router, using the pieces cut out on the CNC as a template. It is very difficult to make smooth and precise cuts with a jigsaw, but with a router, a template and a flush trim bit it is much easier. That is how I made all four sides for the stand and I could be sure they're all identical. And this is the piece that's going to go at the bottom and hold the frame together. It's nothing fancy, just two straight pieces of plywood glued together. So this is what the stands look like. I've only added a small but critical component, these brackets in the corners. Initially I was thinking of screwing the acrylic to the frame, but then I realized that's probably not gonna look very nice. So instead I made these J-shaped pieces on the CNC and glued them onto the frame. Their function is to hold the pieces of acrylic from both the top and the bottom. They should be able to provide enough support without the need to drill through the paintings. Speaking of which, they are now finished and almost ready to play music. However, I first have to attach the exciters to them. So I turned the paintings around and cleaned the back surface with alcohol to remove anything that could prevent the glue from sticking. The exciters come with a self-adhesive layer covered by a protective film which I have to remove. This one has to come off as well. Then I picked a spot following the guide document and stuck the exciter in place. And I hope I've done this properly, because after this point there is no going back. I intentionally made the brackets wider than the acrylic. I filled the additional space with felt, which is soft enough so that it doesn't damage the painting, yet thick enough to provide good friction. The paintings slide into place from the side and the felt holds them so that they don't move. As any set of speakers, these require an amplifier. I chose to use this one, the KABM215, again from Dayton Audio. If you have watched my review, you already know that this amplifier board has its flaws, but I wanted to use it anyway because of its built-in DSP feature. It allows me to adjust the sound if I need to, and chances are I will have to with this kind of experimental speaker. Besides, it already has built-in Bluetooth and enough power output to drive the exciters. So the big question, how do my speakers sound? Well, as it turns out, the very thing that makes the magic happen can cause a lot of problems as well. The first time I powered them up, I heard a lot of distortion. Most of it was caused by vibrations, the exciter shakes a lot. So I stuck these felt pads to the legs of the stand, which made a big difference. Also, I found out that the brackets must hold the acrylic very tightly to prevent it from rattling. Another unexpected issue, these do not like being close to a wall. I think that the reflections from the back interfere with the sound and drastically reduce bass frequencies. So after all the tweaks and with the right placement, these speakers can sound pretty good. They will not replace a proper set of bookshelf speakers, but considering they're made out of about $50 worth of parts, I'd say that the sound quality is acceptable.
If I were to do this project again, I would focus more on the stand. I would probably make it much heavier. I'd also try to come up with a better way of attaching the paintings to the frame, perhaps with bigger brackets or something else entirely that would hold them more tightly. That aside, my primary goal with this project was to make speakers that look unique. And I think that goal has been achieved successfully. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.